The first Belgrade International Motor Show was held 80 years ago, in March 1938. It was one of just nine registered motor shows in Europe. Belgrade welcomed 107 companies who brought with them 375 vehicles. There would have been more, historians recall, but for the limited space, 117 potential exhibitors were turned away. 80 years later, there's room at the 2018 show for more than 350 exhibitors. Although European auto sales at 15.5 million last year are roughly similar to America's 17 million in number, the two markets are very different. European sales are broken down into more than 30 countries, each more often than not with very distinct preferences. More than 70 brands fight it out for each hundredth of a potential point in market share. Here in Serbia, Fiat was the best-selling automaker in 2017, followed by Škoda, Volkswagen, Renault and Ford. Across the river, Croatia preferred Volkswagen, followed by Škoda, Opel, Renault and Ford. Serbia contributed almost 30,000 vehicles to the European total last year. Croatia added roughly 50,000 and Bosnia 10,000. All three countries, once part of Yugoslavia, speak effectively the same language, called Serbo-Croatian but sometimes divided by politics into Bosnian, Croatian and Serbian. If you were cruel, you'd call Alfa Romeo Fiat's perpetually underperforming brand. It's never done more than 250,000 units a year since Fiat bought it in 1986. But emotion-driven Alfa is outselling its Fiat parent in America so far this year, so there's life in this niche brand yet. The rear-drive Giulia and Stelvio are in Europe joined by the older Giulietta. Here's your first look at the new Audi A8. The big sedan is due in the States later this year, and its must-have tech is mostly related to autonomous driving. Audi is expanding its range at home and abroad, recently adding the A3 compact sedan to its American lineup and the Q2 city crossover in Europe. Volkswagen's premium brand from Ingolstadt, Germany, cracked 800,000 units for the first time in Europe in 2015 and 200,000 in America that year. BMW may be a premium brand, but it sells more than three quarters of a million cars in Europe each year. A new 5 Series arrived last year, helping it beat Lexus to number two in America by just 500 cars. And the M5 has now debuted as well, zero to 60 in under three and a half seconds, although the all-wheel drive, however switchable, will be controversial with rear drive enthusiasts. The new X2, confusingly enough similar in size to the X1, was shown in Belgrade for the first time, as was the i8 electric Roadster. There's also a new X3. France's Citroën hasn't been seen in America for almost 45 years a few grey imports apart. Back then, Citroën was as known for its large, comfortable cruisers as for its cheerful and quirky small cars. These days, for now at least, only the small cars remain. Here's the recently revised C4 Cactus, with thoughtful air pockets in the doors to resist parking lot dings, and a return to the hydraulic suspension which made Citroën great. We think Citroën needs a real luxury car again for context. The brand struggled to do much better than half a million cars in Europe last year. Dacia, the Romanian budget brand owned by Renault, profited from the economic crisis about a decade ago. Here's a revised Duster for the past eight years, a very capable SUV for under $20,000. Dacia cars are built around the globe in Romania, Morocco, India, Russia, Turkey, Brazil, Algeria, Colombia, Argentina, and Iran. What would a car show be without Ferrari and Lamborghini? Maranello was represented by the all-wheel drive GTC4 Lusso, capable of 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds, while Modena sent the Lamborghini Huracan GT3, which 
does the deed at a breathtaking 2.6. The Lamborghini will be driven by Serbian racing driver Milos Pavlovic this year in several races including the 24 Hours of Daytona. Italy's Fiat sells twice as many cars in Europe in a month as it does in the States in an entire year. Among its newest cars is the 124 Spider, which recalls the 70s Fiat Roadster of the same name. It's based on the Mazda MX-5 Miata. The rest of Fiat's cars wear the face of the little 500. These include the 500L, which is assembled here in Serbia in a plant which used to build the Yugo and other Yugoslav cars under the Zastava brand. Fiat was given Zastava by the Serbian government in 2008. Interestingly, the Yugo, more than 30 years ago, did twice as well as Fiat does in America today. Ford's European volume is half its American sales, although with many of Ford of Europe's cars available in the US, there's less difference between the two ranges than ever before. There's the new Fiesta ST line, similar to the old car, but that's no bad thing. Fiesta has been one of the best subcompacts to drive for the better part of the last decade. The Honda Civic is a rather more flamboyant car than it was at launch 45 years ago, in time for the 1973 gas crisis. Look at the gloriously B-Wing Type R, which in Germany last year set a Nürburgring record for front-wheel drive cars. And here's a quick fact. Honda's sales in Europe are a tenth of what they are in the United States. The Accord, among America's best-selling cars, isn't offered in Europe at all. Korea's Hyundai outsells Honda in Europe. It has had a steady march upward over the past 10 years, albeit slightly more slowly in Europe than in America. The new Kona, a small SUV with a Citroen-like front end, gives it an entry in a burgeoning new segment. Hyundai design is led by people such as Peter Schreyer of the original Audi TT and Luke Donkrevalka who came from Bentley, Lamborghini and Audi. There's still some work to do in getting a common theme together though. Infinity has been making half-hearted attempts at the European market almost since the turn of the millennium, but Nissan's luxury brand finally got serious a few years ago with a more complete lineup. At 12,500 cars sold last year, it's no threat to Lexus, which did four times as well in Europe, but it beat Cadillac in Europe by a considerable margin. Isuzu no longer bothers with SUVs like the Trooper and Rodeo and is confined to the D-Max pickup truck. Isuzu has been building diesels for more than 80 years. It's very good at them and can't be happy about Europe's upcoming anti-diesel regulations. The Jaguar E-Pace is the only Jag to offer only four-cylinder engines. It's Jaguar's second crossover on the heels of the F-Pace of two years ago. Jaguar designer Ian Callum once said that a Jaguar SUV was the car he never wanted to create. But the challenge has been good for the brand. Once trapped in its past, Jaguar has over the past decade again become forward-looking. There's a fly in the ointment though. The vast majority of Jaguar's European sales come from Britain. Kia has tracked the rise of Hyundai in Europe and the two brands have in the past several years begun to more successfully diverge in style, if not quite intent. The new rear and all-wheel drive Kia Stinger in twin-turbo form capable of 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds is a dramatic shot across the bow of German performance car stalwarts. Its lines are said to have been inspired by the Coca-Cola bottle. The Russian Lada was never sold in America. Most European sales are in Germany, where the Neva, a 40-year-old design which still cuts the mustard when the going gets tough, enjoys cult status. Renault has invested in Lada, and although the brand remains a minor player, its newer models espouse a common design theme and good equipment for the money. These are some very affordable cars, with prices starting at just $9,000. Land Rover sold more than twice as many vehicles in Europe last year as it did in the United States. In both markets, its sales have doubled since 2010, with investment from India's Tata, which also owns Jaguar, 
and new models like the Range Rover Evoque and Discovery Sport. Like Jaguar, Land Rover remains heavily dependent on its British home market. Mazda owns this bright red color. Out on the road, it's as stunning as the dynamics of its vehicles. From the MX-5 Miata Roadster to the Mazda 6 sedan, virtually every of Mazda's cars feels light on its feet. That makes reporting on Mazda frustrating. The Japanese manufacturer, which is now free of Ford and out to prove that it can survive alone, hasn't cracked the 2% market share mark in America since 1994, and in Europe since 1992. Mazda owners tend to be a very enthusiastic crowd, and one hopes the brand can grow without giving up its principles. On the back of a new E-Class, Mercedes-Benz was the number one luxury brand in America by some margin last year. The S-Class, E-Class and C-Class look similar once again, but it seems not to matter. More than 10 years ago, the CLS merged sedan and coupe in a four-door profile with a dramatic roofline. Today, it is in its third generation. Mini is the only evidence that BMW ever owned Rover and Land Rover in the 90s. Its newest models, now in their third generation, are the largest yet and considerably larger than the 1959 original. Mini sales in Europe cracked 200,000 for the first time in 2016, and the brand sells five times as many vehicles there as in the States. Controversially, the Mini front drive platform is making its way across the bottom of BMW's range as the Bavarians ditch rear-wheel drive in their most affordable models for better space efficiency. Mitsubishi isn't doing much better in Europe than it is in America. The manufacturer that rode the SUV boom in Europe in the 90s while winning the hearts of American enthusiasts with the Eclipse is now down to half of what it did in those heady years. This appropriately named Eclipse Cross hopes to reignite passions for Japan's oldest automaker. With Nissan taking a 34% stake in 2016, and Mitsubishi skill with electric cars and traditional fondness for new technology don't count the 100-year-old brand out just yet. Nissan sells more than half a million cars a year in Europe, a third of what it does in the States. Its Micra subcompact is new, sharing its engines with the Renault Clio. The Qashqai compact crossover was a smash hit when it launched in 2006. Now in its second generation, it's been a sale from all sides. You'll know the Opel Insignia as the Buick Regal, and this may be the last time an Opel becomes Buick. After nearly 90 years of GM ownership, the German brand has been purchased by PSA Peugeot Citroën. Opel sells roughly a million cars a year in Europe, holding steady with between 6 and 8% market share over the past decade. But a fair sight down from the 1.6 million sales, 12% of the market it was able to command a quarter century ago. The Peugeot 5008 proves that large crossovers don't need all-wheel drive. It's the seven-seat upmarket version of the second-generation 3008, which was Europe's car of the year in 2017. The mid-size 508 is eight years old and aging gracefully, but a new one launched in Geneva a few weeks ago. Despite the declining demand for mid-size sedans, particularly from mainstream automakers, it should help what is one of the world's oldest surviving car companies boost its European market share back over 6% and 1 million annual units. Booming sales in larger SUVs have convinced Renault to renew the Colios, which shares a platform with Nissan's X-Trail. After some ham-fisted premium models over the past 10 years, Renault is doing a better job in the image segment, with Colios, the recently launched Talisman sedan, and the Espace minivan. Although the compact Megane has not done as well as expected, Renault outsells its Peugeot and Citroën French rivals in Europe. Seat's Arona is a new, smaller sister to the Ateca SUV. The VW Group's Spanish brand has some of the youngest customers in Europe. As its brand blurb states, 
Our story begins in a beautiful land, Spain, a country by the sea full of light, art, and passion. People, the company says, expect Seat to be warm, to express the spirit of Barcelona. The Škoda Karak is a new small SUV replacing the Yeti and similar to its VW Group sisters, Seat's Ateca and Volkswagen's t rock One step up is the Kodiak, launched two years ago. With 4.5% of the European market last year, the Czech arm of the Volkswagen Group is doing well, having found its own style and now offering more than just a budget VW. Rumor has it they're looking to build a new plant in Europe. Sangyong is South Korea's fourth largest automobile manufacturer. Now owned by India's Mahindra, it builds SUVs and crossovers. Despite having been around since the 90s and despite its reliance on Mercedes-Benz engines and transmissions, it remains an unknown quantity. Sangyong sold about 17,000 vehicles in Europe last year. Subaru has tripled its sales in America over the past decade, but similar success in Europe has not followed. The brand is known for capable four-wheel drive systems, characterful boxer engines, and a fanatical if relatively small owner base. Suzuki no longer sells cars in America, and its show hit won't pull any heartstrings in the States either. The small car specialist has launched the Ignis, whose design references the SC100 WizKid, a 70s rear-engined pocket rocket which Suzuki hopes that Europeans, especially the British, where it was a minor sensation, remember. Suzuki also sells the Swift and Baleno, and a slew of small crossovers, choosing to play to its strength rather than to try to improve on its weakness which since time immemorial has been larger cars. Toyota's CHR goes after the Nissan Qashqai and new Volkswagen Group trio of T-Roc, Atec and Karok. Toyota continues to demonstrate a newfound fearlessness when it comes to design that, as Auto Car Magazine puts it, is likely to lose as many fans as it wins. There's a hybrid version, but not the diesel power which remains popular in this segment, at least for now. Volkswagen's Arteon, a four-door coupe positioned above the Passat, was presented alongside Ivan Ashpanovich, reigning world indoor long jump champion. Complete with a digital gauge cluster seemingly identical to Audi's virtual cockpit system, it won Germany's prestigious Golden Steering Award at its launch last year and is targeted at those who like the Passat but want something a little more dynamic. Following an investment by China's Geely estimated at $11 billion, Volvo, which means I roll in Swedish, is on a roll. Its XC60 received an award in Belgrade, and its 90 series cars, the S90 sedan, V90 wagon, and XC90 SUV, present a credible alternative to the usual luxury fare. At the other end of the scale, the new XC40 is Europe's car of the year. Volvo has invested heavily in developing the safety technology expected of the brand, including active collision avoidance technology and semi-autonomous driver assistance. In design and image, the brand has credibly evolved to occupy the space that its now defunct crosstown Saab rival, when at its best, used to. Stylish, somehow without really trying, and different, for reasons one presumes, has something to do with integrity. Volvo sells half a million cars annually, in total, most of those in Europe. It has targeted sales of 800,000 by 2020. Finally, this shows awards. Though not quite the dynamic equal of some German rivals, the Volvo XC60 is at least as stylish and, some might say, the intelligent option. In New York, it just beat the Mazda CX-5 and Range Rover Velar to the title of World Car of the Year. The Opel Crossland X is a fine example of what awaits Opel in the future, it is based on the Peugeot 2008. And a panel of Serbian journalists voted the Volkswagen Polo the best car of the show for under 15,000 euros, that's $18,500.